and then inside they look like this. So it's called a raft and it looks like that, just rows and rows of batteries and if you see there's these pockets which are for forklift and the idea is that if you've got a problem with the battery you can literally un undo the safety restraints, put a forklift in, lift it out, drop another one in. If you want to you can lift that out, you can put a diesel generating set in instead. So for a hybrid train, a bit like hybrid cars where you've got an engine and a battery, you can lift that out, put a, a gen set in instead. So you get your batteries, we're charging them at the moment off my uh, my latest Tonka toy that I built, which is um, it's a 17 litre Volvo diesel engine driving a half megawatt alternator and that produces three phase AC. So it's exactly the same as you'd have in an industrial factory or something like that. And then inside it is the biggest Halfords charger you've ever seen in your life. You know, the sort of little box that you get from Halfords to charge your car battery in the winter. Well, the one that's in there is about half the size of the blue bit, which is the back, which is the generating set. And that converts AC to DC. It's quite clever the way it does it. It converts it so it, it's not noisy, and it also converts it so you don't just switch it on with a bang. It ramps up slowly when it goes in. So is that DC or AC? This is DC down here, yeah. yeah. So, uh, whoop, whoop, good question, yeah. Uh, about 300 amps is the most you can get down that piece of cable. You will notice that there's three cables, not because it's three phase AC and one's a different size. The two big ones are the DC supply, so it's 300 amps, positive and negative. Then the other cable is a protection cable to make sure that nobody gets electrocuted at this end. So you have to have the plug actually into the train to make sure that nobody can get their fingers over the end of the plug, <coughs> make sure they get electrocuted. <coughs> and the other thing it does is the smaller cable is a crush cable. So if you had this like in a car park somewhere, I mean, we're lucky here, it's only foot. Say this was a, 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 a path where you could have lorries going past, they could actually drive over the cable and they could damage the cable. So the smaller one would crush before the big one does. And the way we do that, if you've ever heard of a thing called a rectifier, that's what converts AC to DC. We have a rectifier on the train at the end of this smaller cable. The AC comes from the charger all the way through, through the rectifier, all the way back. If the cable gets crushed, it effectively shorts out the rectifier and turns the power off. So it's just to stop anybody getting hurt, that's why that's done. Once you've got the DC out of the batteries, that comes out at about 750 volts, which is the same as London Underground voltage, because these were London Underground trains. It goes into these boxes. Can you see the boxes with all the vertical black fins? That's the electronics. They're basically electronic switches. And what they do, they take the DC, which is always on, DC's continuous current, and they chop it, and they chop it into three phases. And that makes AC again, which is exactly the same as we generated. But instead of generating it at a fixed frequency, which is what we get out of the generator because it's a fixed speed engine, it's variable frequency. And that's how you get the speed of the train changing. Are they finest? Um, Are they they're actually IGBTs. Okay. Yeah. It's my glamorous assistant who's working on the uh, <laughs> charging. Yeah. Um, you, you, you have rectifiers which are fairly thick and you can't control them, SCRs which are thyristors which you can control the gate. And then these are IGBTs, which are basically MOSFET transistors, a whole string of them in a row. With high voltage, all, all electronics doesn't like working at high voltages, it all likes working at low voltages. So like the batteries are only 24 volts, each of those green boxes is only 24 volts. But if you have 100 of them, you'd end up with an awful lot of voltage. So we've got 20 of them in a row, and that gives us just over 500 volts. The same with the IGBTs that do all the switching. There's just lots of transistors in a string. So each one's only got a small voltage over it and that's how it works. So the black box there with the heat sinks, uh, the heat sinks on the outside, that's what produces the rails. And you'll hear that whistle. When we pull out the station, you hear that And that's as the high frequency is going. So the motors are AC and that's being produced by those, those boxes. Right, each raft has got 100 kilowatt hours of energy in it. How many kilowatt hours? So how many kettles is that? A lot. Yeah, I think that's a probably a, a, a best answer. If it takes, here we are, if it takes, you look scientific, then it takes two minutes to boil a kettle, and the kettle takes two kilowatts. How many kettles can you boil with 100 kilowatt hours? <laughs> it's not pointless. Uh, three, three thousand. I'll let you think about it. Three thousand. <laughs> So that's a lot of power. To get up and down the hill, we use about 30 kilowatt hours, between 30 and 40 kilowatt hours. 
that's just because of how much we need to. And you've got four battery packs? Yeah, there's four thing? battery packs, so the, the load is shared between the four. The way it works is a battery feeds a block of electronics, feeds a bogey. And the bogey's got two motors on it, one on each axle, and the, that battery feeds that side. And this battery, it goes to the same electronics, but it comes back up here to this bogey. So all the, each of the wheels is, is powered. That's quite important for um, leaves on the line. The more wheels you've got powered in motors, less likely you are to slip. Okay. Uh, so then a battery is a battery is a battery is a battery. And everybody asks me how far will it go? Well, if you think you've got 400 kilowatt hours under there and we're doing 10 miles with 40 kilowatt hours, that tells you in theory you could do about 100 miles. But you never use your batteries that hard. If you bring them, it's like a car battery, if your car battery starts to go down, it's actually probably on its way out. So you try not to go lower than something like, it depends on the batteries, but something like 15, 20%. So you always make sure you've got some left in and you never overcharge them either. And the reason for that is A, they don't like being overcharged, like we don't do for in a restaurant. And B, just <laughs> threw that in, and B, every time we put the brakes on on this train, we don't actually use the brakes. We use the motors to generate. So the motors work back to front. So when we're coming down the hill, the brakes shoes never came on. The only time the brake shoes come on is when it actually park and stop. The rest of the time, the motors act as generators and they push electricity back into the batteries as DC. Very clever, the electronic switching. So that means that you've always got to leave some spare capacity in the batteries, otherwise you wouldn't be able to use your regenerative braking. And on a, a normal route, it's not so much here because it's a bit of an odd route, you're going up and coming all the way down again. But on a normal route, you'd probably reclaim as much as 20% of the energy that you use back into the batteries. That's how much you can you can save. So if you're comparing a battery train with a diesel train, assuming that the energy costs were the same, you're actually saving 20% because on a diesel train, you've either got to use mechanical brakes, or if it's a diesel electric and it's on electric motors, they brake by pumping the electricity into resistors and just warming the atmosphere up, which is the same as happens on London Underground, which is why the tube's so hot. Okay, so uh, that tells you a bit about the energy and what we're going. So big problem with batteries is that a battery train is trying to compete with a diesel train. So when we are at the top there, we saw the diesel trains flying past. When they come to a terminus, they come into a terminus somewhere, say so Welsh Valleys or somewhere like that, say so you swing into Merthyr Tidville, which is a terminus at the top of the valleys, okay? The driver stops, puts his brakes on, takes his key out. He then gets out the cab, he walks back, talks to his mate, and he's still got a guard on. He might light a fag, he might not, he might have a cup of coffee, and then he gets back in the cab the other end and he drives off. Four minutes, five minutes, that's all it takes for a diesel to stop for a reasonable, what they call the dwell time. That gives a bit of time in the timetable to, a, if there's a bit of a delay, catch up, lets people get on and off. With a battery train, if you've gone to Merthyr Tidville from Cardiff, you've got to put 230 kilowatt hours of energy back into the train in four minutes. I see your eyebrows are raising, sir, you just realise the mass of this. To do that, you need something like 1500 amps at 750 volts for four minutes. It's an awful lot of power. And there's two things about doing that. One is getting the power onto the train, physically getting it on the train. You wouldn't do it with a cable like this. Um, and two, the battery, although it looks just like a battery, and it's got a, it's a big box with a terminal each end, as well as producing electricity out of it, it's also got its own what's called internal resistance or impedance, which means that whenever a battery is passing a current, it actually warms itself up a bit. And the higher the current you, you pass, what's from Ohm's law is I squared R, obviously <laughs> the arts, not the sciences. Uh, I squared R, so the square of the current, the heat comes out of it, which means that the higher the current, the heat comes out at a far, far greater rate. So you warm the battery up, and that's what you don't want, because batteries don't like getting hot. These batteries that we're using on this train, we sort of inherited this from a project that was done with Bombardier called the IPMU, which was the first battery train that was tried. It wasn't a great success because they didn't start with a light train. These were only 30 tonnes of carriage. They started with a 55 tonne carriage and had less batteries than this and wondered why it didn't work. We've started with London Underground, so even this big member that goes the full length of the train is aluminium. Everything's aluminium. Aluminium, aluminium. So only 30 tonnes, which is a lot lighter than your ordinary train which means when you put batteries underneath it, the battery rafts only weigh one and a half tons each. You're only putting three tons of batteries underneath. And some of the lads who were on the train before, who were here before, a big tall guy with ginger hair, they're from D-Side. And D-Side had the first battery train in Scotland, which was this one in the 1980s. 
Okay, 15 tons of batteries and it didn't get from Aberdeen to Ballater. It ran out of power before we got there, so they had a few issues. Um, that's, that's still, it's, well, it's not really preserved, it's sort of a bit rusty to be honest, but anyway, that was the first one, that was in the 80s, that was the first attempt. So lithium-ion batteries that we use are far more compact, it's what they, it's the, what they call the energy density. You get far more energy out of the same volume and out of the same weight. The other thing with batteries is you don't want them to catch fire, especially on a train, there's all sorts of safety regulations for, for trains. And so you have to make sure that A, they're managed, and so there's what's called the battery management system, which looks at every cell on the, in the battery, it makes sure the temperature's okay, makes sure that all the batteries are roughly the same. If they aren't, you have to balance it up. That's why your uh, Black & Decker Hoover that you bought in 1994 at Christmas died by Easter in 1995, because the battery's really quite poor inside. One cell fails and the whole thing's useless. So we have to protect against that. Yep, okay, if you're ready. We have it. We've got 20 minutes now. Oh, yes, please. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. See, I thought you same time. Okay. Um, so uh, th these batteries, they can only take so a certain charge rate. We're limited by what we can put in. And it's roughly what can go through a cable. Uh, bigger batteries you can use, the, because these London Underground trains, we're looking at putting the old shoes back on. So that's London Underground collector shoe. That's what you never see, usually, um, if, you're, if you're on the tube. You see the sparks from them, same on the third rail metros, you see the, the, the thing. The problem with those is there's a limited amount of current you can put through them, because it's iron on iron, and you've actually got a brilliant welding set. So there's, there's a limit to what you can do. The other thing you have to do is keep the batteries cold. So the next generation of these, we're looking at all those sort of things. We're building a development system to, to improve on the, the battery technology, improve on how we can get the current onto the train. So at the moment, we're using a diesel generator, which is, I know, not green, and I was picked up by one or two people on the last talk. Very sorry. If we've got a big field here, we could actually have solar panels, we could have a windmill, and you could have, instead of the generator up there, you could actually have a bank of batteries. And in fact, by Wednesday next week, believe it or not, that container will be full of batteries. Because the way we're moving from just doing like this is we're going to end up with batteries in the container. They get charged up cheap rate at night or from whatever energy source we can get and when you come to charge the train the batteries in the trailer are used to dump all the power that they've got into the train and because room isn't so much at a premium and weight isn't at a premium in the container you can store an awful lot of energy in a container as long as you can get the power onto the train and so you could then in theory you could get the energy at night time you could get it from wind power or whatever so that's the green cycle that we're working towards so although at the moment we've got a diesel engine charging them that's just necessity really okay any other questions did you enjoy the ride yes right. fantastic ride isn't it absolutely great any other questions the stop by the way if you're in the other carriage was the chairman of the deeside railway who links against the emergency stop button <laughs> It was, a, it was just to prove that the safety system worked and prove that we could start away on a hill. It, was, it wasn't an accident, it was an inf, a genuine, uh, genuine test. Are the electric motors the ones that London... No, they're not. The the new ones? Lon London Underground used DC motors with commutators. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the two things that we've majored on with this is to reduce the maintenance. The whole idea with this is that you only have to go to a maintenance depot perhaps every nine, nine or ten months. Because, as I said before, we're not using brake shoes to stop the train. We're using the regeneration, and that works right down to about three miles an hour. So literally, the, the mechanical brakes are only needed as a parking brake. There's no, no other real real need for them. Um, so uh, because everything else can be done from the side, if this was a diesel set, you could bring it out with a forklift. You just need yeah, a concrete yeah. pad here. Um, so you know you don't need maintenance. The big maintenance issue on the London Underground, as was, they were DC motors. We've gone to AC. AC, you don't need a commutator. The uh, commutator is a very high maintenance unit. It's got carbon brushes, you get carbon dust come off it. They wear, they get flash over, they get water in them, because these used to be district lines and they come out into the yeah. open, so they yeah. get all sorts of issues with those. So these are new TSA motors by a firm in Austria, completely sealed, fit and forget. So the maintenance on these is just far superior, much greater intervals between uh, maintenance visits. Sorry, the motors are about the same weight actually, yeah, the bogies are about the same, yeah. The, the, the bogies were refurbished not long before these trains came out of service. They're also a very special bogey. And if you see just this side of the shock absorber, you can just see a rubber, or see a bolt sticking out with a red head on it. That's a rubber mounting. And um, 
London Underground track standards are far different to ordinary mainline track. When you, when you travel, I came up on a Pendolino this morning. Very nice. Had my breakfast because it was late because the chef didn't go on until Preston. <laughs> so I had to wait. But the Pendolino, is, you've got very level track and you hardly feel it. London Underground, as you will know, you can see, if you see down the train, it's doing this all the time and moving. And so the, the bogies have got a far greater um, amount of non-linearity to cope with. And one way of solving that, instead of having a solid bogey, which is two big lumps of steel with the axles on suspension, is to actually make the, the two halves of the bogey pivot. So these are split bogies. They've got rubber mountings on either side. The whole bogey pivots, and it means that you can... That's why the ride is so great, even on rail like this, which is fish-plated and not welded rail, because the bogey just takes up that, that extra variation by, by twisting. And then it's all rubber, rubber cushioned. Okay, we're going up here. How long have you been on? We're just putting a bit in each end. We don't need to really recharge because we've got enough capacity, but we thought it'd be interesting just for people to see us recharging it. So instead of having the, this, when the thing goes into production, you won't have a long cable. You'll have basically shoes again. The train will come in. There'll be some rails there. Pick the power up off the rails and away it goes. Any questions? Any more questions? So, yeah. No? Right. I'm going to find a cup of tea, I think. <laughs>